This coming Sunday is the 35th anniversary of the most destructive and deadly tornado outbreak on record in Pennsylvania on May 31st, 1985. To look back at that historic event, I'm joined by three meteorologists who were in the Penn State Weather Center that day. Two familiar faces to longtime Weather World viewers, Fred Godomsky and Paul Knight, and Dr. Greg Forbes, who went on to become the severe weather expert at the Weather Channel. Gentlemen, thanks for sharing your recollections of that day that's certainly seared into the minds of, of so many Pennsylvanians. Um, so let's sort of set the stage here. At that time, Weather World was less than two years old in its current format. Paul, tell us a little bit about the show at that time and, and your role on it. John, uh, Fred and I were the co-hosts and co-producers of the program, and we were responsible for all of its content and the scheduling and the planning of it. Uh, we did the forecast, and we were introducing new weather segments in the new program, it included an extended forecast, which was seen on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And it was in that segment that we actually first saw that this event was a potential uh, important thing for Pennsylvania. Fred, at that time, where was the show being recorded and what time was it being done and how did those logistics work? Well, we uh, recorded at the uh, studios of the local public television station, uh, Channel 3 here. And uh, of course, we were on the opposite end of campus uh, at the Walker Building. And so that's about a mile and change apart. And uh, each day we would have to prepare our paper maps in the weather station uh, with magic markers. Ah, the fumes were everywhere in the weather station. And then we would, uh, at close to airtime, rush out uh, into the parking lot, crossing Atherton Street, 322, uh, avoiding traffic and trying to get across campus at rush hour in order to record, uh, actually to do the show live uh, at uh, 6 o'clock, 5.30. Greg, you had joined the Penn State faculty in 1978, I believe, after getting your PhD under Dr. Theodore Fujita at the University of Chicago. What would a typical day have been like for you in late May of 1985? Well, I think at that time we were in between, uh, at, after the spring semester and before summer started, uh, and so I would mostly have been doing research at that time. And in fact, on that particular day, I was trying to finish up a talk that I was supposed to give for a, an American Meteorological Society conference that was going to be held at Penn State starting that the following Monday. So uh, I was sort of out of one eye, keeping an eye on the weather and the other, I was trying to get my talk ready. And, and Paul, could you just briefly remind the audience that this was 1985. I mean, what was the state of the art in terms of data and models at that time? Uh, well, the models were still pretty sophisticated, John, but the, but the data and the ability to gather it was, was pretty primitive. There was no internet. I mean, it was just in its infancy and we didn't really have much access. Uh, there was still the facsimile machine. There was still uh, teletypes around, although we got the data on our computer terminals. As Fred said earlier, you know, we were, we were getting our jollies from sniffing uh, the magic markers that we used for our paper maps. Uh, so the, the tools of meteorology were in Walker Building and the tools of television were in Ragnar Annex, uh, which were far away and they were not intermingled at all. So once we left the building, uh, we had no idea what was going on elsewhere. And Greg, the department actually had a, a weather radar at that time, which turned out to be a vital observing tool that day. Tell us, tell us about that radar. Yeah, there was up on the roof of Walker Building a, a radar that was called a WSR-74C. It was a National Weather Service radar, similar to the ones that they had in Erie and, and Harrisburg, for example. Uh, and, and it was operating. Now, the radars at this time, they were not Doppler radars. They just showed you where there was precipitation. Uh, and you could see the shape of these rotating thunderstorms as, as hook echoes when they were close enough to the radar. Uh, I should also point out that the computer models at this time, nowadays, we can actually predict the radar patterns ahead of time in these cloud resolving uh, computers. At that point, uh, the, the re resolution was real coarse. So I, I was monitoring as the afternoon and evening progressed, I was monitoring that Penn State's local uh, radar uh, there from uh, Walker Building. Now, 
and one thing that people might not even believe is true is at that time, of course, we had that nice radar uh, right on our roof at Walker Building, but we really didn't have ready access to all the National Weather Service network of radars that people can get on their phones and computers right now. So as things uh, start to occur, it is not necessarily the way it is today where we get up to the minute uh, information from around Pennsylvania. So it sounds like once we get to the lead up, Paul, you alluded earlier that on Weather World, I believe you and Fred had actually mentioned as much as a week in advance, the possibility of May 31, 1985 being a significant severe weather day. Yes, yes. Um, Fred would remember this as well as I would. I, I think it was the Friday before, so it was a week in advance. It could have been that the Monday preceding. Either way, it was anywhere from a eight to a five day forecast where the signature of the pattern that we could see in the computer simulations uh, were that it looked like a severe weather outbreak. In fact, the word tornadoes were even mentioned, if I remember correctly, and Fred can back me up on that one. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, he did say the T word on that uh, extended forecast. And of course, it was a it was really what our new segment on extended forecasting was meant to do. We became very frustrated with the idea of the five day board where there was a single icon and a number to show what the weather might be three, four, five, six days in advance. This gave us an opportunity to describe things like Paul got to describe. We could understand the pattern pretty well and that this was the type of pattern that people needed to have a heads up. So let's just jump to the day of then. It's, uh, as Greg mentioned, it's, it's between spring and summer sessions. Were the phones ringing off the hook in the weather center that day? Fred, uh, I mean, do you, do you have a recollection of there being a buzz? I, I do not have a specific recollection of a buzz during the day. As the afternoon went on, the buzz increased a bit. But I think Paul can speak to this that as we were preparing the show and things were just starting to go way out off to our west, it wasn't absolutely clear what would unfold in detail in Pennsylvania. Is that how you remember? Yeah, I remember Fred, that it was uh, in the central part of the state, it was one of those low cloud humid days uh, with a south southeast wind and uh, it, it was not blistering. It was not like we would expect a storm to boil up nearby. All the action was beginning to take place in Northeast Ohio and Northwestern Pennsylvania. So, so and, and as uh, I seem to recall, it wasn't until very late in the afternoon, we were skedaddling across campus a little after five, uh, and, and I think it was 4.30 or so when the first tornado watch went out. So, so there wasn't a lot of window uh, for us to be able to say, oh yeah, look, here it comes, Jim. Okay, we're, we're gonna take a little bit of a break now and we'll continue this recollection of May 31st, 1985, uh, a little later this week on Weather World. Uh, Paul Knight, Fred Godomsky, Greg Forbes, you hang on, we'll be back with you. <laughs> 